climate change lie number eight exposed. The science is settled. Claim. The science is settled. 97% of scientists agree climate change is real, man-made, and dangerous. Barack Obama, 2013-05-16. ClimateRealityProject.org says the science is settled. Investors.com announced in December 2017, quote, climate scientists are now suing critics who challenge settled science, end quote. But there are several facts that make the counterclaim far more likely that science is never settled. If we knew everything in the universe, then we could say that any and perhaps all science is settled. But we don't know everything. There remain plenty of unknowns. And that makes science exciting. Perhaps I am biased against science ever being settled, because that would be boring. But I'm not talking from bias. I'm looking at the current state of science. For the longest time, researchers thought that the geocentric nature of the universe was settled science. But too many anomalies were cropping up in their astronomical observations. The movement rate of planets changed over time. Faster, slower, faster again, and sometimes even reversing in their path, what is called retrograde motion. The perfect celestial spheres were no longer so perfect. Researchers had to add more and more complexity to their perfect system until it all started to look like some cumbersome Rube Goldberg contraption. For hundreds of years, the basic assumption that the universe was geocentric was accepted as an unassailable truth. Anyone who questioned it was a heretic and was guilty of denying settled science. The effect was to shut down any and all discussion, so beware of anyone using the term settled. Then along came Copernicus and Kepler, voicing brazen ideas that the sun was at the center and that the planets orbited the sun in elliptical paths instead of perfect circles. Suddenly the complexity that had been added to the celestial spheres was no longer needed and the imaginary celestial sphere itself was called into question. In the early 20th century, Harlow Shapley discovered that the entire solar system was orbiting the hub of what had long been known as the Milky Way. This led to the short-lived idea of a galactocentric universe. Later, in the 1930s, Edwin Hubble discovered Cepheid variables in the Andromeda Nebula and determined that Andromeda was much too far away to be a part of the Milky Way. Thus, scientists discovered that the universe had many centers, and ultimately no common center at all. Is this part of science now settled? No, we still have much to learn, and anything that seems to be settled is only relatively so, because there are so many unknowns. In science, there are no absolutes. In the early 1980s, I heard on a radio program that a scientist in the 1890s had pronounced that everything of significance had already been invented and that all the great discoveries had already been made. This, of course, was when we had the light bulb, the phonograph, the motion picture, automobiles, and radio. But we did not yet have airplanes, television, personal computers, the Internet, rockets to the moon, and planetary probes. To that late 19th century scientist, science, every science, was settled. We now know that he was horribly wrong. He did not know what he did not know, so his arrogance thought that all he knew was all that there was to know, and was all that there could ever be to know. A bit short-sighted, that. Sir Isaac Newton's laws of motion had been tested and found to be sound. But during the late 1800s, scientists started to notice anomalies that put Newton's laws into question. The puzzle was downright maddening. It took a quiet genius named Albert Einstein to unravel a knot that had stumped all the scientists of the world and had unsettled what they had thought to be settled science. Einstein's genius was in using imagination to think outside the narrow box of what had been known at the time. The solutions would never have been found within the known data. The idea of relativity was a bolt from the blue, something that was beyond knowledge. It required imagination to see it. 
Later, a growing body of evidence corroborated Einstein's educated guess, his beautiful hypothesis. So you see, even though Newton's discoveries had been called laws, they were still imperfect. Newton never would have known that they were inadequate to describe all motion. He simply did not have the experience or evidence that was needed to see that his science was not settled. Corollary Claim But climate science is different. Because of the great concern of all humanity for the welfare of civilization and of all life on Earth, we've had far more scientists working on this problem. So climate science is settled. Really? Fact. The warming alarmists have given us many failed predictions. Despite the thousands of scientists working on computer models and billions of dollars poured into this enterprise, the warming alarmists have generated many failed predictions. If the science were settled, then all predictions coming from the science would be perfect, but they're not. That proves the science isn't settled. Dire predictions of polar bear numbers plummeting with a decrease in sea ice simply have not materialized. PhD zoologist Dr. Susan Crockford drives this point home in one of her articles. As a polar bear expert, she is keen to point out the actual numbers, showing that from 2005 to 2015, with sea ice going down 38% since 1979, polar bear numbers actually increased 16%. More warmth means more food. On January 15, 2007, Michael Mueller, socialist, state secretary in the Federal Ministry of Environment in Dyzeit, stated, Quote, the global temperature will increase every year by 0.2 degrees Celsius. End quote. That didn't happen. In February 2007, the global temperature anomaly was at plus 0.19 degrees Celsius. In February 2018, the global temperature anomaly was at plus 0.2 degrees Celsius a blistering increase of 0.01 degrees Celsius over the 11-year period. Their prediction would have yielded an increase of 2.2 degrees Celsius for that period, but we only got 0.45% of that, less than 1% of their prediction. We're virtually at the same place we were in 2007. More than that, the root mean square trend line for the entire 21st century so far shows only a plus 0.197 degrees Celsius increase in the global temperature anomaly over the 11-year period. That's still far below their 2.2 degrees Celsius prediction, less than 9%. In 2010, Dr. Morris Bender, NOAA, and co-authors predicted that, quote, the U.S. Southeast and the Bahamas will be pounded by more very intense hurricanes in the coming decades due to global warming, end quote. They stated that the strongest hurricanes may double in frequency. There has been no massive increase. In fact, for the period 2005 to 2016, there was a massive scarcity of hurricanes in the American Southeast. In 2007, Professor Wieslaw Maslowski, Department of Oceanography, U.S. Navy, predicted an ice-free Arctic Ocean by summer 2013 and said the prediction was conservative. We still have summer ice in the Arctic. In 1989, Noel Brown, director of the New York office of the UN Environment Program, UNEP, said that entire nations would be wiped off the face of the Earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. As global warming melts polar ice caps, ocean levels will rise up to three feet, enough to cover the Maldives and other flat island nations. Last time I checked, the Maldives were still there nearly two decades after their deadline. Companies are still selling vacations to the Maldives. In 1994, a study by Columbia and Oxford University's researchers predicted that under CO2 conditions assumed to occur by 2060, food production was expected to decline in developing countries, up to minus 50% in Pakistan. Even a high level of farm-level adaptation in the agricultural section could not prevent the negative effects. Has this happened? No, of course not. In fact, quite the opposite has occurred. Pakistan food production, for instance, has been keeping pace with its population growth. 
In number six of this series, I cover some of the hard facts that prove crop yields not only increase with more CO2, but that the nutrition also increases. In 2005, Janos Bagardi, director of the Institute for Environment and Human Security at the United Nations University in Bonn and the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, warned that there could be up to 50 million environmental refugees by the end of the decade. So did this happen by 2010? Of course not. In fact, as of 2017, only one person has claimed climate change refugee status as the world's first climate change refugee, Ione Te Tota from Kiribati. His claim was dismissed by a court in New Zealand in 2014. So this one climate refugee's claim was invalidated, keeping the number of climate refugees at a resounding zero. So you see, with so many failed predictions, the UN scientists and their warming alarmist friends have a lot to learn about the universe around them. When they can't get their predictions right, they prove that the science is not settled. Fact. Warming alarmists have fudged scientific data to make it fit their narrative. Michael Mann and others have fudged climate data to make it fit their narrative that climate has remained relatively stable until the industrial period and then temperatures took off. They erased the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age. They hid the decline in temperatures from one of their tree ring proxies. How can we take scientists seriously if their so-called settled science is based on fraudulent manipulation of climate data? They ignored the work of dozens of other climate scientists. Tony Heller has been pulling back the curtain on junk science for years and is understandably upset the amount of fraud that is being passed off as science. In the recent National Climate Assessment Report, Mr. Heller found several errors that should never have made it past peer review. Something is definitely broken in the realm of climate science. Let's look at what they did wrong. Note that their graph directly contradicts the text up above it. The text says the 1930s remains the peak period for extreme heat in the United States. Very high confidence. Yet the graph below it shows the 1930s as being a very cool period. How does peer review allow this sort of utter garbage to get through? NOAA still has very poor coverage in Africa and South America, which is represented by the gray, and yet they're reporting record heat in areas where they have no thermometer data. I don't know how much worse science can get than this. They have very little data in Africa, very little data in South America, very little data in Greenland, very little data in Antarctica, very little data in northern Canada, and despite the lack of data, they're reporting record warmth. I'm not sure what they're doing, but whatever it is, it's not science. So we've seen that the land data is fake, and as it turns out, the ocean data is fake too. This climate gate email from Phil Jones spilled the beans. For much of the southern hemisphere between 40 and 60 south, the normals are mostly made up as there is very little ship data there. They're simply making up the ocean data. Now I'm going to switch to an animation which shows how NASA has altered their U.S. temperature data since 1999. Where NASA used to show cooling, now they show warming. What they did was they cooled the past and warmed up the present to create a fake warming trend which doesn't exist in the raw data. All of this history was very inconvenient for NASA, so they did what they typically do. They simply erased it. NASA got rid of the 1940 spike and subsequent cooling, which was reported by NCAR in 1974, and replaced it with a fake continuous warming trend from 1880 to the present. NASA's behavior is straight out of Orwell's 1984. They're behaving as the Ministry of Truth. And one year ago this week, NASA sent this letter to Australian Senator Malcolm Roberts, denying that they were responsible for this. Fact. Climate data has been based on poor sources. The United States has perhaps the largest network of temperature stations in the world, but quantity does not always translate into quality. 
The most famous example of climate data set gatekeeping came from Phil Jones at the Climate Research Center in an email to Warwick Hughes in 2005 on February 21st. I should warn you that some data we have are not supposed to pass on to others. We can pass on the gridded data, which is their modified data, which we do, but even if the World Meteorological Organization agrees to this, I will still not pass on the data. We've got 25 years or so invested in the work, so why should I make the data available to you when your aim is to try and find something wrong with it? That is the basis of science. Science should be self-correcting. This is a failure of science in the highest degree in what he said. A lot of people don't know that climate data, at least the surface temperature record, is actually single source. Uh, people have this idea that some of those other acronyms that I threw out are actually separate data sets. Well, they are, but they all originate in one place. NOAA's NCDC, which was now renamed NCEI, or the National Center for Environmental Information, is in charge of collating and presenting the entire world's surface temperature data set. Their data collation and adjustment methods have never been fully replicated outside of that organization. Again something that science holds dear. Replication has not been done. Data sets are presented as anomalies, and this is one from NASA GIS. And as you can see in the far upper right, there's the pause up there that uh, everyone's been talking about. But you never see it presented this way. Now this is what the actual data looks like if you plotted it on the scale of human understanding and experience. If you plotted the actual temperatures like you'd see them on a thermometer and write them down and do the average for the year, this is what it would look like, essentially flat on the scale of human experience. There's a slight increase you can see from left to right and there's some, some variation from year to year. But in terms of human experience, we couldn't really ourselves easily detect global warming. It's, it's so small within our scale of experience and sensory perception, we couldn't really detect it if we didn't have these tools to extract and magnify it like some of these data sets do. And then there's another problem. A lot of the surface temperature record is infilled. Now, there are thousands of weather stations around the United States. These weather stations are run by a lot of volunteers. Some are just people that are doing it in their own backyards uh, as part of the Cooperative Observer Network. Some are at police stations, fire stations, and so forth. But the thing is, is that a lot of these have disappeared. A lot of them have stopped reporting. And what's been happening is that NOAA has been increasing the infill, the interpolation between stations that have dropped out. And according to Tony Heller's analysis, there's now almost 40% of an infill going on. I think that estimate might be a little bit high, but the fact is, is that there is some infill going on in the surface temperature record. So instead of dropping these stations, they try to interpret, interpolate the data as if the station was there. It seems to me to be kind of a, um, a, a manufactured result. So the problem stems not just from adjusted and missing closed station data, but from the insistence of NOAA and CDC on using obviously bad data, such as stations like the following. This is from my surface stations project. This is the University of uh, Arizona at Tucson. This is their weather station in that little cage down there. It's in the middle of a parking lot. And the reason it ended up there was because the university kept growing and growing. It used to be in a grass field away from the campus, but the campus kept growing and it had a limited land grant. And they kept having to move the weather station. And finally, they put it right out in front of the atmospheric sciences department. Now, when we discovered this and we reported on it, the station closed within about six months. NOAA closed it because obviously it was reporting the temperature of a parking lot rather than representative of the area. Here's another station not too far away in Carefree, Arizona. Now they have the NOAA official MMTS temperature sensor. This is run by a volunteer observer. But you can see it's, it's measuring the temperature basically of a large asphalt parking lot. Now we discovered this station because of a tool that used to be on a site called Hamweather and they would plot the daily highs and lows, and this one stood out in the middle. Look, look at that one little red dot in the middle of a sea of blue and purples and some oranges there. And we wondered why that one set a record and none of the others. Well, when we investigated, we found out it was measuring the temperature of a parking lot, and that's why. And in our 2012 early release of our paper, we found this to be true with compliant and non-compliant stations. The two stations that I showed you pictures of are not compliant by NOAA's own siting rules. But when we look at the raw class 1 and 2 compliance stations, they have a trend of 0.182. The ones that are non-compliant have a trend essentially almost double that. And the NOAA adjusted data is also almost essentially double that. 
My premise is, why are we keeping all of these bad stations in the record? Let's just look for the best stations and use those as the metric to measure temperature change. And if it was getting warmer, we would expect to see increases in the number of record highs. We have not. This is uh, state record highs by decade. And as you can see, recent times haven't set any new state record highs. In fact, most of them were set back in the Dust Bowl area. And the number of 90 plus degree readings at all U.S. historical climate network stations has been going down. Yikes! And another temperature station was placed next to an industrial air conditioning exhaust vent, good for lots of extra artificial warmth to skew the climate record. Fact. Climate gate. In late 2009, emails were extracted by a hacker from the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. Those emails showed fraudulent intent to manipulate the climate data to keep others from gaining legal access to the data and to block scientists with opposing viewpoints from being published. Phil Jones, then head of the Climactic Research Unit, or CRU, said that the emails were taken out of context. But were they really? Mock investigations focused on the trick mentioned in one email exchange with Michael Hockey Stick Man, but failed to discuss the reason for the trick to hide the decline in temperatures. These extra words can hardly be taken out of context, especially when you read some of the programmer's comments in the CRU Climate Data Software Program. The programmer's comments reveal not only that the program was buggy and full of problems, but specifically fudged data to manipulate it toward a specific, unscientific objective. For example, plots 24 yearly maps of calibrated PCR infilled or not, MXD reconstructions of growing season temperatures, uses corrected MXD, but shouldn't usually plot past 1960 because these will be artificially adjusted to look closer to the real temperatures. Look at those words, artificially adjusted. Another programmer's comment specifically addresses the temperature decline they wanted to avoid. Computes regressions on full high and low pass Esper et al. 2002 series, anomalies against full northern hemisphere temperatures and other series, calibrates it against the land-only temperatures north of 20 degrees north, specify period over which to compute the regressions, stop in 1960 to avoid the decline. Had another one. Specify period over which to compute the regressions, stop in 1960 to avoid the decline that affects tree ring density records. And yet another one. Specify period over which to compute the regressions, stop in 1940 to avoid the decline. One programmer wrote a very troubling note in a text file regarding unexplained errors in the program. 17. Inserted debug statements into anomdtb.f90. Discovered that a sum of squared variable is becoming very, very negative. Key output from the debug statements. FORTL error 75 floating point exception. IOT trap core dumped. So the data value is unfeasibly large. But why does the sum of squares parameter, optot square, go negative. In another note in the same text file, the programmer voices his frustration. 22. Right, time to stop pussyfooting around the niceties of Tim's labyrinthine software suites. Let's have a go at producing CRU TS 3.0, since failing to do that will be the definitive failure of the entire project. Later in the same file, the programmer remarks about fake or questionable data. I'm very sorry to report that the rest of the databases seem to be in nearly as poor a state as Australia was. There are hundreds if not thousands of pairs of dummy stations, one with no WMO code and one with, usually overlapping and with same station name and very similar coordinates. I know it could be old and new stations, but why such large overlaps if that's the case? Arg. There truly is no end in sight. 
Perhaps the most troubling comment reveals the utter disarray of the CRU's flagship data product. Here, the expected 1990 to 2003 period is missing, so the correlations aren't so hot. Yet the WMO codes and station names, locations, are identical or close. What the hell is supposed to happen here? Oh yeah, there is no supposed. I can make it up. So I have. Smiley face. Several mock investigations of ClimateGate were performed that supposedly exonerated the guilty, but the investigators themselves were guilty of conflicts of interest or a lack of competence in the field of climatology, lack of clearly stated objectives, and failure to achieve the few vague objectives they published. Interviews were limited to the accused. Experts critical of the accused, who knew what had happened and understood what the emails were saying, were not interviewed. Problems with the IPCC science were not discussed, but were central to the problems revealed in the emails. Investigators let the accused suggest which papers they should read. This is exactly the type of investigation you would expect from criminals investigating themselves. And this is the science they want us to think is settled? Junk science and horribly mangled data. No thanks. Discussion. The premise of climate change hysteria is all wrong. Global warming is good. We live in an ice age and remain near the bottom of Earth's livable temperature range. Any significant cooling of the past has resulted in famines and societal collapses. Significant warming of the past has resulted in prosperity and abundance, and our current modern warm period is the coldest of the Holocene's ten major warm periods, thousand-year cycle. All of this beneficial global warming has been blamed on CO2, and that would be good if it were true, but CO2 is a weak greenhouse gas with very little effect on global temperature. We saw this in earlier episodes of this series. Each of these facts pokes big holes in the warming alarmist claims and helps to refute the settled science claim. If the very foundation of their so-called settled science is itself false, then everything they claim as settled is called into question. Fact. Settled science is an oxymoron. That's right. The term itself is a self-contradictory phrase. It is meaningless, because science is never and likely never will be settled as long as there are unknowns in the universe. Conclusion Science is never, ever settled. Until we know everything in the universe, science will never be settled. We don't know what we don't know, and that alone means that there are potentially many more things to discover about everything, including gravity, time, motion, energy, matter, and especially something as complex as planetary climate.